Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are coming from. Welcome to the Controversial Exchange. This is your host, Ryan O. Before we jump into it, I just want to do a quick reminder, all right? The Anchor app. This is a really cool way to call in and we can actually just boop, drop you straight into the episodes. If you have any thoughts or feedback as you're listening to these, make sure that you hop over there, anchor.fm backslash the controversial exchange. Today's our first back and forth with myself and Dimitri. So let's just roll that intro. All right, welcome to the Controversial Exchange. Man, we have a really exciting one here for you. We went all over the map, man. It started with narrative, right? <laughs> oh, dude, it was, yes. <laughs> and back and forth. and they're in, they're in back again, a Controversial Exchange story. <laughs> <laughs> so our plan on this was just to kind of start seeing where we can riff on the microphone, what that turns out to be. Um, there's a whole lot of articles referenced, different things out there and tools referenced. Um, this starts to become a theme on self-management and narrative and what's your own story. How do you pursue and understand those sort of things? Um, sure. Self-management super, is a big one. Yeah. I'm, I'm really excited to share it with y'all. Do you have any, I guess, anything to intro with here? Yeah. I mean, I just think that uh, I hope that when people listen to it, they approach it with an open mind and they don't look at the terminological way that we talk like the words that we use to talk about it even though they're not behavioral and we're not necessarily using them in a mentalistic way we're just using them to describe how we feel about a particular thing and that they could potentially be broken down and and described behavior analytically if we really needed to do that but that's for research articles and that's for publication that's not for open discussion and discourse and dialectic when people are trying to exchange ideas in everyday conversation yeah and that's the goal of this uh as always, like there's other outlets and different people that tackle different things on podcasts. So if there's anything relevant, we'll link other podcasts and maybe break some of this down or whatnot. But that is the point of it. Hope you enjoy. Buckle up. Here we go. Bam. Look at that. We're recording. Rock and roll. Welcome to the Controversial Exchange Podcast. We're hyped. We're stoked. We're pulling up our materials. We're getting ready. Um, This is... This is actually perfect because I'm really fresh off of this uh, reading on this topic in a few different ways. And there's a special issue and I read a bunch of the special issue sort of work. So in perspectives of behavior science, what used to be called the behavior analyst. Now they have, uh, they did a special issue on narrative. And, and so it started with this Phil Heinlein article talking about how we should try to understand what's going on in narrative. Basically... He cites like you could approach it from any different sort of approach, whether you want to look at it through verbal behavior, if you want to look through the different component skills when it comes to general, generalized imitation, those sort of skill sets that are needed to be able to share and spread stories. You can look at it from the naming literature, from the RFT literature. He pulled it apart from all these different angles. But the thing is, is there it's not a really solid conceptual analysis. Yeah, there's a whole lot of components that are involved. Um, and it's a good starting first article, but it's not comprehensive and like, it's not like a Bear Wolf Rizzy 1968 where like, boom, we laid it out. Here it is. It's just kind of the first starting article. And then there was a bunch of different people that replied to him. Two in particular there's, that were super cool was uh, Ronnie Dietrich. We'll get to that one in a second. And then Critchfield. Critchfield, um, Tom Critchfield. You read, have you read any of his work? Yeah, I've read some of his work. Yeah. Uh, I've read some stuff that he did on uh, matching theory, I think, or matching law. Yeah, I, I appreciate his... I appreciate his rawness and just like, I don't give a hell or I don't give a fuck about like just being like blunt and to the point. Um, but like, and what he, so what he talks about is like, these things need to be taken in the context of an experimental empirical line of research. And it's like, cool, let's do that. And so when I emailed and asked him and said, Hey man, like if you got any opportunities, I'd be interested in getting involved in that sort of stuff. There's nothing going on. It's just another article saying we should do this sort of stuff. And it's like, come on. That might be a, a, some that I actually might disagree with that. What, how so? Explain. Um, well, I mean, it depends on when he says empirical research. I mean, does he mean single subject behavior analytic research or does he mean all the research that's just been, that's been done in psychology in relation to personal narrative like that? It falls under those designs. Right. I mean, what, what, what kind of research are we talking about here? What, I mean, there is a ton of validation for personal narrative and that kind of thing and, and how words matter. I mean, also all the VB literature basically is that only you apply it to 
the way you mitigate or control your own behavior, right? Yeah. So and then you have I, Joseph Campbell and the power of myth and the hero of a thousand faces and stuff from the sixties and seventies that basically lays out the hero's journey, lays out all the power of stories, the power of narrative. Uh, it's been the justification for why they write comic books the way they write them. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm serious though. Yeah, like, dude. Yeah. You found the common, like what is it? I think it's the common like 18 cycles that every great epic story has had since the epic of Gilgamesh to the Bible, to Hercules, to yep. the gods of Olympus, to Superman and Batman to Neo in the Matrix. I mean, like it's literally the same story told in, with different dressing, but the the highs and the lows and the emotional call and response that it creates are the same. So, I mean, like, I mean, do we need to have a conversation about epigenetic narrative? Maybe <laughs> that would be interesting, uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> an interesting um, way to go about that, huh? So, I mean, to quote uh, Critchfield exactly, he said with he said, "Nice to hear of the interesting work that you're doing." Because I had mentioned to him that I was. I was trying to put this into a workshop format and see where it could kind of go. He said, my perspective on all of this is that it's important to be as evidence-based as possible. Narrative is a big topic. And as a former English literature major, I can tell you that an awful lot that's said about it is just made up stuff. If the stakes really are as high as we all pretend, then we have a moral and ethical responsibility to get this right. And I kind of feel like, yeah, cool. <laughs> that's what we could say about anything that we do in behavior analysis. The fact that we are the fact the fact that we're trying to influence human behavior makes that sort of statement valid, right? Um, cool. And then he said, with that in mind, I have to respectfully disagree with Dr. Highline's recommendation that you check out uh, personal stories told by behavior analysts. And so he referenced this book that uh, there's there's no, no no there's a few different ones that are out. The Cambridge Center put out this book that's called Behavioral Science: Tales of Inspiration, uh, Discovery, and Service, where they just got a bunch of people, mostly uh, males, <laughs> some females, to, to write in and talk about uh, their personal stories and, and how they got interested in the field and such. And I personally love that stuff, man, because it's a side that you don't get with the articles, right? Um, and it's super important. So that's what he was saying he was disagreeing with. And that's what Heinlein was referencing. And he said for, yeah. To finish, finish his quote real quick, he said, quote, uh, to continue, for one thing, these are just generated subjectively, not empirically based. Like, like everything that is being written by a researcher is also falling under that. So if you're going to have your critique be <laughs> that these things are subjective, the writing of these articles are also subjective. They have the same sources of an influence, Right. There's no control procedures going into the way that these people are writing these things. So in my sense, this is, or my understanding, this is just an arbitrary line that a single person is drawing as to what is acceptable and not acceptable. You can say it's empiricism, but it's not. Like, sorry, you're off the mark. Um, it's good at bat, I guess. Like, good swing, but it kind of sh strike in my my book. But Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of confusing descriptive and normative claims. Yeah. I mean, like, like behavior analysis in, in the, the, the scientific process that elucidates the underlying mechanisms or whatever uh, principles that affect behavior, that's a yeah. descriptive claim. When you're talking about how ought one to live, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a normative claim. So they're, they're just different thresholds of discussion and truth. I, I agree, man. Um, so you said for another, there's one thing on which – we have lots of accumulated evidence as a group. Behavior analysts are just plain lousy at engaging non-behavior analysts. Yes, there are exceptions like Pat Fryman, but normally speaking, normatively speaking, the returns are not good. Um, we're shitty at normative. We're shitty at normative discourse because it's deductive, not inductive. So when you approach everything from an inductive perspective, you do miss the ability to have a conceptual conversation that requires deductive reasoning. Yeah. Um, so you said, just to kind of finish it out, with that in mind, there's a ton of research on the effects of stories and what constitutes an effective story, but all this is from outside of behavior analysis. Um, and he links me, I can include it, um, a glimpse of something that he enjoyed that is uh, relative to that. It's a, actually a neuroscientist and talking about Super Bowl ads. I haven't read through it, but we'll include it for folks. Um, so for folks listening, we're talking about this because um, I recently conducted a workshop in Florida testing out uh, what's kind of been a 
a, a clear change in trajectory in my field now, or my, my career of, it spans back to Cal Abba 2018, that one where everybody talked about. And I had interviewed a guy named Ronnie Dietrich. And Ronnie put me onto this book called Houston, We Have a Narrative by Randy Olson. And Randy uh, was a microbiologist. He's pro- um, marine biologist. Let me correct that. Marine biologist at uh, the University of New Hampshire. And he moved down to Southern California, went into Hollywood, went into filmmaking, storytelling, and realized um, that it was really hard, just like I have been, and has pursued a whole lot in the last 20 years. Summed it up in a couple different books. This is one of his most recent And it kind of lays out how you can approach um, what he's learned so far into a model to try to uh, disseminate and share in different ways. It doesn't have to be video. It could be all sorts of different ways. Um, And his big takeaway is you talk about things in an and, but, therefore method. So he says scientists are really good at saying you should do this and this and this and this and here's all the stuff and here's more and here's more and here's more and here's more research and more research and more things to consider and more and more and more and more. And this and, and, and just gets really plain plain and boring and dry right man it just reminds you of every behavior analytic conference that you've probably been to um that you can find an example of that sort of stuff there um and we can maybe get into that later it's not to critique the person themselves it's just uh that that cultural way in which we do things has kind of been preserved i think um but then he talks about you can have this one that's very disorganized and doesn't make sense so rather than just listing a bunch of art uh uh facts or statements or whatever it is you can have one that's just kind of all over the place listen a bunch of different shit i think i fall in that area sometimes and the goal is to fall, fall in the center where you're just really clear saying there's this sort of statement and then this but when this thing comes up this is what we should do or therefore this is a result and that simple narrative abt format was um what one of the co-founders of south park uh trey what's his last name yeah, Trey Parker um, uh, talked about as like how he goes about trying to make a better story. He replaces his his uh, his words and like his stories with that sort of framework. So anyhow, we before we hit record, Dimitri and I were talking that I just got off a phone call with him. I'm gonna go check out um, Randy Randy Olson, not Trey Parker. That is <laughs> uh, right. Um, it, it I got off a phone call with Randy Olson. I'm gonna go check out one of his. Uh, storytelling workshops that he does. There's just happened to be recording one in Boulder uh, City, which is in near Las Vegas. So I'm gonna book a trip to go down there um, and check it out because there's something to this man. He's working with the national, the national parks down there, dude. Um, and it was really interesting. Like the he's working literally with like our federal government on trying to like figure out how to get people to 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 do better and treating our national parks and in, in those sort of ways and those sort of people back. And he said. The biggest thing he's found is there's kind of spectrum between people that are very holistic sciences versus very analytical sciences. And he said anybody on the holistic approach, he can um, he can resonate with very, very quickly. But when it's folks over on the analytic side, um, they run into problems all the time. And I was like, hey, that kind of makes sense. (laughs) That's that's probably what explains part of our field is we're so damn analytic. Um, Oh, man, I don't I don't know if I agree with that. But yeah, no, why not? Because we're not analytic. That's bullshit. We're intervention. I think we say that we're analytic. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. I think yeah. the reason I and the reason I point that out is because the, you kept talking about the therefores and the the thens and the ors yeah. and inclusive versus en- exclusive ors. And again, that goes back to, I mean, what you're really describing is being able to take inductive information or empirical evidence and construct a deductive argument from it or a convincing argument from it. Right, and that's. Yeah the marriage of philosophy and science. So science gives you the data. It gives you the, the validation and support that represents nature, but philosophy gives you the why. So science is the what and the how and philosophy is the why. And like when you're talking about normative conversations, you're really talking about being able to identify the why, man. And your why. Yeah. yeah. The narrative is the why narrative is the why and the who. Um, in Randy's book, he was talking about how you have this issue of scientists think that they're very, very, uh, very inductive and like the essence of it is always a very inductive approach yeah it's it's inductive reasoning it's it's bottom up which again bottom up is necessary to validate and to validate a hypothesis in terms of creating adequate amount of evidence to support it and making sure that it's properly repeatable and meets all the thresholds of a scientific inquiry but i mean induction is or deduction is how human beings articulate points of view and concepts to each other 
in a way that's cogent because that's how you follow logical threads. What I actually I pulled up a little book here, an old ass, an old book from back in my undergrad days. If anyone wants to study logic, just like simple logic, symbolic logic, not just yeah. like word problems. Here's a little, uh, logic book here with a work workbook that you can get super cheap. It's probably out of print now, or you can get it. Read it, read it to everybody real quick. The Beginning title. logic by EJ lemon. Okay. And it's uh, just about breaking down your P's and Q's. So taking a sentence, it's, it's logic is the link is the mathematics of language, man. And, uh, as a matter of fact, it's the RFT stuff. There's a guy named Jose Burgos from the university of Guadalajara who wrote a critique of early critique of RFT because he, he reduced it down to basically a, combination of bundle theory and symbolic logic he was he was he was wrong only that it didn't logic doesn't uh, doesn't account for the behavioral stuff but as far as like general conceptions they're very closely tied to each other really yeah, yeah. that's cool man um i've read a little bit in logic i need to read more i actually have a whole slew of books sitting on my uh shelf that i ordered forever ago i don't remember where i read this but someone I was reading, oh, it was this creativity book. I was reading, I'm reading this book called uh, like Great Artist Steel or something like that. <laughs> and they were saying that uh, books on a bookshelf are your highest priority or something like that. If there's books on your bookshelf you haven't read are your highest priority um, or should be your highest priority. And I was like, man, there's so many things that I've like dabbled in, but I haven't finished or whatnot. Um, so yeah, the, I think the interesting implications for this sort of narrative structure in our field is like you were saying, there's a ton of evidence we can point to outside of the field of behavior analysis, whether it's what you talked about, whether it's what's talked about Randy Olson's field um, in his book, whether you're talking about the thing that uh, Thomas Tom Critchfield linked to me. Um, there are so many examples. Yeah. And if anybody wants an example, like look at all the 150 plus pseudo treatments for autism and like figure out what they're doing. They're using good stories and case examples to be able to push and pedal what's going on. Um, so there's no, for me, there's there's, there's, I've talked about this, but there's data in the sense of like your graphs and your journals and that sort of shit. But then there's your actual data. That is the things available to you, which in this case, the data is, uh, or the data do include all those other fields that are doing this sort of stuff that I listed before. And that to me is plenty evidence enough that we should be exploring this sort of thing. And I don't agree with Critchfield in the sense of like, Yes, we have to get it right, but like us not doing stuff is just as harmful potentially as trying to move forward into it with an empirical mindset, right? Um, like ignorance may be bliss, but it actually hurts people too <laughs> when you have the power of something that can maybe help affect uh, ethical uh, behavior change, right? Like we do. That's about, again, going back to the normative claim thing. I think that's why uh, like ACT is the first thing that's that. Uh, for me, from my point of view, that initially sounded woo woo, but when I started reading about it a little bit, actually made sense to me from a behavioral point of view because of the way that it, the way it interacts with values. Because values are your narrative. Values are the, the 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 ethos that you choose to live by and you ascribe towards, and you choose to project that image out into the world and and, and exist in. And if you're if your values are wrong or aren't really actually resonating with who you re who you are intrinsically in and of yourself, mm -hmm. right? You're, you're going to be in conflict with yourself and you're never going to really be able to actualize the things that you want to achieve in your life. So yeah, I, I, I think that narrative is about sorting yourself out and getting your values straight and making sure that you tell your story, not just to other people, but to yourself that in a way that makes sense and uh, is consistent with who you want to be. And uh, is that empirical? I don't know. I think it's how, uh, how one ought to live. Um, yeah, dude, it's like worked for me in so many great ways. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, it's a great question, man. So literally this is the question Socrates asked. This is the first great question. How ought one to live is the entire examination of philosophy. That's the yeah. question. It's addressed by Aristotle in the Nicomachean ethics is addressed by Marcus Aurelius in the meditations is addressed by Descartes. It's addressed by Nietzsche. It's every single great philosopher should to tackle the question of how ought one to live. And it's about sorting out your values and be in, in actualizing who you are and living your truth, you know, and that's where narrative comes into play. And there's that, there's that new thing that's been out. Well, I don't know if it's new, but um, a lot of, a lot of self-help gurus or whatever point to this thing called being the hero of your own story. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah you want to achieve something great or if you want to get a goal done, you know, you, you, you sit down and you write out who you are, where your starting point, where you want to be and what you need to do to get there. And you place yourself in the context of, of good and evil, man. And you live that you, you wrestle the dragon and yeah. 
you be the hero of your story. So yeah, I, narrative is absolutely essential to that. And I think there's not enough discussion on the poetry of it. I think if you're like, even from, I've had this problem in my own life that when you get too caught up in the hardcore empiricism and the hardcore scientific point of view and, and borderline objectivism, where if it's, if you can't feel it and if you can't see it and touch it, it's irrelevant, you know, you lose sight of the poetry of life, man. And uh, narrative dresses that up and adds a little poetry to living. So, yeah. I, uh, you reminded me when you said that of when I was in grad school and it just finished and, we were starting up the center down there in Florida. Um, all I did always was just read our field's literature. That was it, dude. Like I either did that. I talked about it. I drink beers talking about it. I worked in the fish lab. We worked with pigeons. We went to work. That was it. That was it. I literally like was in school with somebody uh, that was uh, at that time, like a year below me. So I was helping in that sort of capacity. I would run like the study sessions for a cohort uh, with a couple of folks when people needed help. I was doing online tutoring in that sort of regard. Um, and the, the fish lab was literally attached as a mother-in-law suite to our house. Like there was no separation of anything whatsoever. Um, and it, it's like blank. Like I learned shit during that period of time that like stays with me. But I like that was like just a dark ages time where I don't remember enjoying a lot of anything. Yeah, I mean there, I mean it's like think of a movie, man. That was a montage. <laughs> that like yeah. the, the montage in every movie is where all the hard work happens. But it's always if you were to play it in real time, is the is the horrible, sweating boring as hell, shit, boring, <laughs> kill yourself time where your yeah. the hero is transforming themselves into from the weakling that they once were to the power Why, let's talk about this why do you think people don't want to do that sort of shit so like we were talking about so we were talking about before we hit record on here that uh it may be fun to go through and look at some of the forums and what's being talked about and kind of provide some discussion around those sort of things one that i had seen is people saying that uh it maybe makes them uncomfortable or that they're not as a fortune of a situation to where that they can, um, you know, spend all the time reading all these books because they have other competing things where they don't have the cash or whatever it is. Um, what's your thoughts on that, man? Like, I mean, that's, uh, I mean, I have a gentle version of that and I have a hard version of that. I mean, the, the, gentle, hard, the, the, the gentle version is that life is hard and imperfect and, you know, people reach out for help and if they can get it, they can. The harsh version of it is that uh, behaviorally speaking, people will engage in the least amount of effort to access the maximal amount of reinforcement. And if the internet yeah. doesn't provide you answers, then why bother putting in the effort? I think what separates people like, I don't know, people not to sound like See, an arrogant dick, but I mean like somebody like you and me who can just sit down and bullshit for two hours about nonsense, you know, yeah. and actually sound semi-cogent is that we have one point in li our lives embraced the suck. <laughs> yeah. See, and to me, to me, I was literally told by one of my best colleagues um, that you go to graduate school and you assume it's a prison sentence. You're not going to enjoy your time. You're going in and you're learning as much as you possibly can on everybody else's rules and like you will come out of it and you will rebuild your life. Um, and I get that people will go into those sort of things with different situations, but like, or like with different, um, everybody comes in there with a different history and with different expectations and like different programs will share that sort of stuff. That's not how it was articulated to me by my program to be, be very clear there. That was not coming from any academic advisor. That was coming from a colleague that had been in uh, a program and been around a lot of people in programs like that before. Um, but man, like, I, I mean, I know for me, like I was told what you do is part of the, to marry it back to the narrative part. Like I was told these stories of if you want to be very good, you consume everything you possibly can about this field. Um, in so many different ways, you're going to find a niche probably at some point you're going to consume more there, but consume as much as you can about everybody out there. So, um, uh, I yeah, agree. I, I think that's also people not actually living their passion. So I don't know if I agree with that completely. Really? Like, yeah. Cause I think again, dude, I mean, if you, 
this is the so let's flip from normative to descriptive i mean this let's let's actually be analytic you know why why do people not engage in particular kinds of behaviors because the mo's aren't in place yeah for and sure that applies man. to everything right so if you or if, if you don't of, or it's a lack of resources and like the sds aren't there that's, i mean but sure i think those uh, things I, have been gotten yeah. those things have gotten a lot easier like you can go fucking torrent a book right now yeah. and most yeah, yeah. most books and behavior analysis yeah. that, are, that are textbooks too uh, Dude, um, that, and that's why, like, I hear you on the resources thing, and yes, of course, like, not everyone has the same opportunities, et cetera, et cetera, okay, fine, but all things being equal, all right, and from a scientific, from a, from a behavioral point of view, yeah, the real reason people aren't, someone wouldn't engage in a particular behavioral response is because they are not adequately deprived or satiated or have the particular MO acting upon them in that particular instance, yeah. period. You know the one that, I agree with you there, um... The one that I found most interesting was when people would uh, state that they value it and they want to do it, and then the SD's there, but then behavior doesn't occur, man. You know what I mean? I mean, that's that's the diff- That's just full of shititude, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right? <laughs> there I, is yeah. such a thing as being full of shit, and, well, and then I mean, we don't like, have an empty supply of it. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like... I think part of it, I wonder how much of it is like kind of issues with contacting the delayed reinforcers and like the delayed discounting component there. Right. I like, mean, like I don't, I, I don't benefit from some of the best books I've ever read because of what they gave me the next day to work with. I benefited with them because I had that knowledge when I was looking at everything else in the field. Like, of course, like, uh, yeah, gold, gold diamonds, blue books that you've been reading. Um, oh, dude! They're, oh my god! They're Can not... I just say, just <laughs> sidebar real quick before you go continue, finish your thought. I'm sorry, I'm gonna interrupt you, but those fuck those, like all due respect to Cooper Heron and Heward, that book is an absolutely wonderful introductory textbook. The Blue Books from Adronis, Gold Diamond, and Thomas, I think, is the guy. Dude, this thing is a a, a mother Cohen. effing masterpiece. Yeah, it's all. I mean, like, and not only that, but. I, I'm reading it as somebody with 10 years experience and I feel like I'm learning. It's unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. And like it's teaching point of view too. It's not just giving, it's not, it's unbelievable. Yeah. It's unbelievable. He integrated the philosophy throughout man. Like it's so, I, I mean, he actually talks about philosophy. See, he quotes Aristotle, man. Yeah. Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like a behavior book, a behavior textbook that quotes Aristotle. Like, so, come on, so be still my beating heart, man. Some context for people. The blue books um, were named that, because they were bound in this blue binding. My understanding of all this was that uh, Israel Gold Diamond, who was at the University of Chicago, he was writing his own um, books, just like Science and Human Behavior was a course, like a book, a textbook that he used for a course. That's going to wrote um, the same for here with Israel Gold Diamond. And the, sorry, I got to mute my phone. Um, good. My audacity file, I forgot to turn it on, so it's starting now. So we're going to have to pull some audio from the fucking, Okay. sorry. Um. So the blue books were, were that compilation. They were never finished, actually. So he writes, um, he wrote them. They were in paper, print copies, wherever, from his students that had them. They turned them into like an EPUB or sorry, an ebook for, or no, like a PDF, kind of linked PDF. PDF. Interactive PDF. Yeah, there we go. Intentionally, actually, yeah. as a tribute to him. Um, and it was put out there on the Cambridge Center's website. You can actually go up there. You can pay like twelve ninety five or something like that. Get a Dropbox link, download them. Um, I'm sure they're online too. Don't tell the Cambridge Center, but like you can probably find them online somewhere. Um, the thirteen dollars is really a barrier. Like go read them. Um, Nine nine hundred and ninety pages of magic. Yes, and the thing that just drove me nuts was that they were so well written, they were so amazing, and he wrote out a table of contents that he did not finish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't gotten that far yet. Come on, I always tell Joe Lang and Paul and Drone, it's like you guys got to finish these, you know, like <laughs> you got to polish these off, um, dude. They're they're a goddamn masterpiece. It's it's I, it's something I wish I had ten years ago. And it's I, yeah, and dude, the same thing. Like I used to get pissed at people when they show me resources like that. I'm like, where has this been my whole freaking yeah. career? Um, I was no one ever referred to it in any class, any fucking conference, nothing. Like it's so good. Let's but anyway. Let's shift back to, that. to narrative. If you don't no, mind. let's shift to that, man. Um, I think that's relevant. Uh, like the narrative of behavior analysis is controlled by people that write it down in certain ways, like. The fact that oh, Izzy, yeah, sure. the fact that Izzy had um, 
negative interactions. I heard he was he was very abrasive with the behavioral community oftentimes. Probably led to part of it not being included. Um, it was different in thinking. So, so for some context for listeners, the ABC model was not a thing that he includes. Uh, he would completely shit all over that, actually. Um, and he includes something that's much more comprehensive. Um, oh, yeah. There are more variables, which most people go, oh, it's more complex. There's more to learn. But he has some of the most beautiful lines in there, man, where he talks about how oh, he's, it's, it's outstanding. He's like, you can approach the world and assuming that it is complex or sorry, simple. You approach the world and you assume that it's a simple world then it's going to appear very complex when you're trying to understand it. But if you approach it on, with the assumption that it's a very complex world, then you can understand all the relations involved and it becomes a very simple thing to understand. Absolutely. And, I, and that's where I, I love like the way in which you approach these things, man, the framework in which you and your mindset of how you're going into there, into there and understanding them is uh, so key, man. And um, I don't know. My hunch is that it was a, a mixture of his abrasiveness with the behavioral community mixed with um, <clears throat> not a lot of students, not a lot of people believing in this sort of view. So I remember distinctly asking Steve Hayes in 2014 or 15, can't remember exactly when it was, either fall or spring of those years. And um, I said, what about Gold Diamond's like constructional approach? And he's like, there's no empirical line, man. Like it didn't really take off. And I was like, well, the only thought I have to that is if you don't have enough people, you can't really test that out. So you can't you know, say there's not the empirical line there of that thought kind of going forward if you didn't actually try to sufficiently test it out. And I look at things like Head Sprout and the 3 million kids that have taught to read as evidence for um, – that line of thinking, you know, like it doesn't have to be in an empirical study, but like that. I feel like I'm reading proto contextualism, dude. Proto contextualism. Like, Break that down for someone like me. Well, I just feel like it's setting the stage for what now we would consider contextual behavior science. Oh yeah. But yeah. it's trying to articulate it in, in the similar, not quite reductionistic way, but in that much more clearly descriptive scientific language that you would see in a conventional behavior analytic frame. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so the other reason I think that it wasn't kind of – so that's a couple reasons. Like uh, I heard that Gold Diamond was abrasive, um, to put it nicely is what I've been told. I've heard that uh, the empirical lines haven't taken off. But we know another thing is like with our certification exam, if it's not popular, it's not going to be voted as like a, something that needs to be onto there. So I can see why people don't include it. But it's – I would have to double check, but I don't think it's referenced at all in uh, the white book or behavior – the other one, the behavior. For... Until you showed it to me, dude, I had never heard of it. And I read a good amount. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and I had never heard of this shit. Um, which uh, we're going to have to definitely release this next month because I have a poster coming out with Israel Gold Diamond that they're working on. Um, awesome. On the website. So to kind of commemorate and honor his work. So, Dude, it's it, I am I am just so blown away and and. It's just so good. I, mostly because I appreciate the the attention to re underlying the philosophy. There's this there's this great uh, Jonathan uh, John Kimball article called Philosophy Matters that he wrote. And what what's great about that article I know is that, that he lay, you know dude, it's a great article, right? Yeah. And uh, what's cool about it is that he lays out this beautiful framework where he shows how the intermingling between philosophy and experimental science versus applied science versus the, actual practice. the technology and yeah, yeah. and actual practice and technologies that emerge from it. He makes a couple different analogies. He gives, gives you a behavior analytic view of that where it's like, you know, you know, Skinner about behaviorism type thing. And then you have EAB and then yeah. ABA and then whatever technological packages yeah. emerge from that, but then physics and engineering and those types of other analogies to other sciences. And, um, it, I just, this is, this starts from the beginning. It, it blends, it begins with philosophy and it moves into that, the EAB type framework Then it moves into an applied point of view. And it just, it follows this wonderful natural flow of really like, honestly, I pull it, pull, pulling people out of the behavioral matrix, man. I swear yeah. to like, cause I mean, we're so plugged in. Well, I mean, we were talking about before we're so plugged in to that rigid interventionist autism bubble, you know, that where all of our practice, all of our research lines are kind of tied to that singular population. So they're contextually kind of framed in that way. And this divorces that and puts it right back into what 
probably Skinner would have done, which was, and he did do in all of his books, which is frame it from a broader behavioral perspective and then pared it down from there without necessarily tying it to a particular context or population or necessary output of people, just general principles. So yeah. it was just really, really, it's just been a really awesome experience to go through it. And I actually got a study group going with a, with a friend of mine where we're meeting once a week and uh, we're, we're, we're kind of Get attacking it a little bit at a time because nice. it is a it's almost a thousand pages and it's, it's technical so it's, it's, it's a tome man <laughs> it's uh you know what i mean it's not not for the faint of heart it's a, it's a journey <laughs> but i'm gonna slay that dragon for sure yeah dude uh happen. i he destroys prompting and like the point of prompting at the end of that in a big ass mm. section it's it's great dude um hell yeah hell yeah fantastic i'm glad that you're digging those man uh, oh, did Jonathan did Jonathan Kimball give you that article when we were uh, out there for that your y'all's conference? Well, I, I I shook his hand, but I didn't really spend any time with him. Uh, Doctor Hoglin actually turned me on to him. Man. Okay, because dude, Doctor H is like my Yoda, man. That dude, <laughs> like he's so sneaky smart. Like you know, he doesn't talk a lot about behavior stuff, but he'll just slide. Hey, you should read this, or he'll he'll talk about something, and I'll pick it up and be like, How the fuck have I never heard of this? Yeah, thing? yeah. Like, <laughs> those, those are my favorite no. people man they're the ones that usually aren't on social media right exactly they're at the bar they're not going to toxic conferences <laughs> they're the ones that have like 35 year member or like 45 year member <laughs> exactly you know yeah um those are those are my people too dude someone was critiquing uh abi and like not going out because the cost and how expensive it was and i was like you know as long as folks keep showing up with those 25 plus your badges like i'm gonna keep going because oh yeah that that i can tell you every single event i've been to um no matter how much the cost was in those sort of contexts like it always i can tell you each abi like who i met and how that informed like the trajectory of what i got going on um i think it's just kind of a lack of being able to connect with the right people at those events that starts to push people away um anyhow that's a different thing but yeah man um jonathan kimball that article he gave to me um, when we were out there for your event, he would invited me over to go, um, have a drink real quick. And Jonathan was there and he said, you got to read this, this chapter, um, or whatever. It's not even a chapter. It's just like a short article and like a, yeah, it's a conceptual piece, man. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It's, it's so good. It was good, man. He wrote into it yeah. recently. I doubt he'll listen to this, but you hear this, Jonathan, what up, man? Um, he wrote in, yeah, shout out Jonathan Kimball. He liked the, the Pat Fryman video that was going around. So, um, we'll get to catch him at ABI again. There's kind of full circle. That's why you go to ABI because you can catch these folks like that <laughs> at these events. Oh, dude, yeah, they're uh, they, they 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 crush. It, it, well, I mean, it's it, there's not a lot. I think our field is get is getting bigger, but it's still kind of small enough to where if you have the courage to just step out of your zone and reach out to somebody, you actually they'll they might respond for real, you know. And Which, uh, if you're willing to read and expand your horizons and exactly, I, I, you know, and that's just about putting, getting out of your comfort zone a little bit, which I think is pretty important. Yeah. Someone was asking me the other day, like, how do you go about doing those sort of things? Like a good example is like how I got off a call with Randy Olson. Like I read his book like a month ago and like you just talked to the author. Um, you got to show people that you've put in the work, man. And like, that is the first step and there's no different in our field. Um, it's not that hard to me. Like the recipes like learn and have something meaningful and try to catch them with a, a different hook. Right. Um, yeah. I, I mean, yes. I also think that it's about go again, full coming back to narrative. I think it has to do with deciding what you want, ascribing to that values line and follow seeing it through to its inevitable conclusion fearlessly. You know what I mean? Like, it, th there's something about that, that, that creates the opportunity that you're talking about. Because even if you could, I mean, I, I can think of two or three people who are bigger bookworms than I am. And, and they are just um, some of the most well-read people I've ever met in my life, but they would never reach out to somebody like that and try to talk to them or, or actually step out of their comfort zone just because it's not their personality. It's not who they are. It's not what they're into. Yeah. Um, but you know, so, so knowledge is important, but I think also the willingness to just say, okay, this is what you want. This is what you go get it. You know what I mean? That's really it. It's, that's, that's more important, I think, and, and more feasible than what, which, what, what, what you mentioned before. Yeah. Cause it's pretty cool that we have these types of people available to us. It's pretty amazing. Like we're going to have, you know, Carl, you know, Carl's going to be talking to us, which is amazing. Yeah. Um, and like Carl Biner, one of Skinner's last students, like this, this, this guy that 
is just, you know, an unbelievable legend of our field. He's OBM master extraordinaire and just like big effing deal, you know? And he's willing to sit down and just bullshit with us for a couple hours. Like, who the fuck are we? Like, what have we done in our lives? <laughs> yeah. You know, um, pretty accomplished person. Or even when Rick came on, Rick's pretty freaking accomplished to, to be willing to do that. So, and a lot of it just has to do with the willingness to get out, get out there and put ourselves out there and see if they would reach out and do uh, and play with us a little yeah. bit. Yeah. There's also, so a, it's cool like that. There's more awareness to, especially with those two guys. Um, of like the role of new media um, and like, and I air quotes like podcast videos and those things helping them out. Yeah, that's true. They are a lot more sensitive to it. And you've, you, and you're in, in all fairness, you, you've done so much work now at this point, you've got enough of a body where you have your own, your own celebrity going on, which is cool. But I mean, well, even so though, I just mean like, as far as like contributing experimentally, I mean, even yeah, no, 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 no. I agree, totally. like, yeah. you know, um, the, substantively the science itself. Um. Yeah, it's yeah. it's a different ball game. Yeah, and like Carl, I mean, I holy hold, shit, how much is Carl I, written? Jesus, a lot ton. Yeah, no, and I hold those two up on like a much higher pedestal than myself any day because of the work and tenacity they put in at those different levels. Man, like that's much harder to operate at that level than making a damn video. <laughs> do you do you ever see yourself changing gears and going down that road? So my thought on research um, and academia. First point is. Uh, I almost jumped into a PhD program right after uh, we started up a center in Florida. I had a couple different options. One offered to me as like a full ride. And I was like, nah, I'm good. It wasn't the right situation with the right people. The other one, um, so I've, I, and the thing is, I kind of feel like I escaped a, a dodged a bullet there. Second was I, I applied for Steve Hayes' lab. And I just told the guy, like, I'm not doing the psych GRE. That doesn't sound fun. If I applied, do you think I'd still get in? He's like, if you're, if you're, uh, if your application is strong enough, sure. And so when I got tonight on that, I was like, okay, cool. And that's when I started getting much more into business entrepreneurship. And I realized like that is much more fun. So, um, academia, like, uh, and that sort of like student work, like you're doing, man, I don't know how y'all do that. I'm done that organized education. It's not for me. The research I value, man, like that is our bread and butter. That's our backbone. Like that's what we have to have. So, for me, man, I really looked after Ogden Lindsley and I looked up to him and how he approached it. He would fund research projects because of his entrepreneurship at the end of the day. Um, yeah. He also had some inheritance or something like that. He had like a good chunk of cash back then um, that he used that I know he didn't hustle for, but I knew he hustled as well to be able to get his cash. And so I looked at that as like a third act of my career sort of thing, man, like uh, what can I do to help fund research and like see the things out that I want to see out? Um, if I can be successful in other areas. Yeah. Um, yeah. The doctorate is one of those things. It's, oh man, it's kind of a means to an end for me. Honestly, I don't know. I, I don't see myself in academia. That's definitely not the case. But not, like, and mostly because I, I think it's toxic and counterproductive and I find entrepreneurship more exciting. Yeah, I just same. think that the doctorate conduct, jump, dipping your toe in that pool and doing some experimental work, I think uh, increases your awareness of it and makes you appreciate it more. It forces you to ingest infinite amounts of information too because yeah. you're graded on it. So I think for me, it's a, just a an external force applying pressure on me to do some work that maybe on, on my own I would be skipping because I oh, have a tendency sure, to read what I want to read, not what I have to read. And that's why I need to read, you know? That's why I did a thesis track <clears throat> master's program where I had to do yeah. something that was applied. Like I did an applied research um, study. That thing took nine months. I The process was just grueling. Um, that's part of oh, the reason. Oh, that's what I'm, I'm, through, I'm going through that right now, dude. IRB is the enemy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I fucking hate them. Uh, they're the worst ever the <laughs> but the the uh what was i gonna say oh but it, in a sense it comes down to what role did i want to play in research and i value it so at that point i also realized that i had weaknesses in a couple ways like i didn't enjoy the the day-to-day -day of a research study like that um I didn't enjoy the writing process and I wasn't the best at the methods and the exact experimental controls that you had to have in place. And I could dedicate, you know, five or 10 years of my life to figure those sort of things out, I think, and be pretty good, or at least have a much better understanding where my skill set breaks down and when to call a friend. But for sure. me, it was more so like, 
have being interested in entrepreneurship, I might as well just leverage and like double down on that sort of stuff. Oh, I, guess. I, I think honestly, I think you're making the right decision. Uh, again, like if I could go back now, hell, I'm already so knee deep into it. I'm, I'm getting this thing done, but, um, <clears throat> I don't know if I, if I was the person I am today, 14, 15 months ago, I don't know if I would be doing it. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, you know, I mean, <clears throat> Bill Gates is a good example. 99.96% of his cash is going to be donated to some sort of cause at the end of the day. And like, sure. when I saw Ogden Lindsley and what I heard from him is that there was a lot of his personal funds that were put into projects and research so that things could be figured out, discovered and move forward. Sure. I know the Behavior Bank itself was worth in today's cash $1.6 million. That was an inheritance of some sort that was put onto that. There was not a research uh, fund or a grant. It was Alex saying, I believe in this idea so much that I will put this much cash on trying to make this thing, this thing happen. Um, and that is an absurd way to go about it. But for me, I was like, man, that would be cool. Cause later in your life you can figure out, okay, what do we really need to figure out? And funding was always the hardest thing, man. Like figuring out how to fund things. I feel like, like if I could wave a wand and I was like, Dimitri, just go study stuff for 10 years. You know how fucking cool that'd be? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty unbelievable. You know what I mean? Um, <clears throat> yeah, man. So, I, dude, creating an engine of uh, – and uh, create like I think like us sitting here doing the podcast even. Like to me, this is a, this is an opportunity to create an engine of some, po- some kind that may in the future support what I want to do the way I want to do it. Oh, yeah. And will this necessarily be the avenue? I don't know. But I think that – Looking at will this get money, you towards that goal? Entrepreneurship, yes. you know, developing some type of revenue generation that's diversified enough, I think is absolutely critical to doing what you need to do when you grow up. <laughs> Period. You know, and bringing it all back to narrative, I think the only way that you can get to the point where you can motivate yourself and and maintain that over long periods of time is constructing an internal monologue and a, and a, and a story that you're working through that makes that horrible part of it, that grindy piece of it, um, something worth doing, you know, (laughs) I saw, I noticed on your, uh, in your talk, you had a picture of Goggins. What, what, uh, what are you, uh, did you just reference him just randomly or did you actually say about him? Uh, so what I was talking about, was so this was different than the narrative workshop that i did just to set the context for people this was the talk which was focusing on my personal story of why i found the chart and precision teaching valuable and so listeners if it's your first time i value that thing on the back end i don't think you need to shove in people's faces but i like parts of it one of those big things was i was relating it to when you're trying to figure out where you're going what you're trying to do in life um fuck video timed out I should be better at this. Call myself a videographer sometimes. I can't even fucking make sure record's happening. <laughs> when uh, when you're trying to figure out what's going on, you know, you have those like five simple steps, those articles that are like how to be the best person and that sort of shit. And there's listicles trying to get you to click in. Um, yeah. But for me, when I was young, like that's when stuff started getting thrown at me. Like I was in the early days of um, the later days, like MySpace, it is prime and it's death. Facebook in its early days and those sort of things. You just start getting a bunch of shit thrown at you and you're trying to figure out what's going on. And what I liked about Goggins is Goggins talked about the montage episodes in detail like you were talking about. So exactly, most, dude. The most, montage. Most things are saying, this is where I was, this is where I, I want to be and where I'm going to go. And my graph, it was a perfect uh, like graph. Um, so to paint it for people, it said um, where you are, where you want to be, um, for kind of like time on the, on that axis. And then it said you suck and then you don't suck anymore. And that was their, their Y axis. And it was just a graph going up on that. And what I talked about there, there was uh, the reason I like Goggins so much is <laughs> most people on those success stories, it's either they don't have time to communicate it necessarily, or they're misinterpreted <laughs> for the work that's gone into there. or People just don't know what it is, but most of those listicles take out the actual transition state, like where you're learning and where you're working really hard. And they just say, here's how you get to there. And it's like, it's like maybe one of those might be like, uh, you set your alarm at four 30 in the morning and you wake up on the first, the first alarm clock. Okay, cool. <laughs> that's not going to get me anywhere, man. Like that's not how I'm going to move forward in life. Like it is not Jack that Willink, one that thing. Is. It is. That is a crucial step perhaps to somebody's self-management routine. Yes. But that is not the only thing that it's going to be. <clears throat> um, and not to throw out like Jocko 
from my understanding of that book, it's still queued up, but I've seen some things done on it. Him talking I've about read it. it. I don't think that's I don't extreme ownership. I've read it. Yeah. Okay. It's it's a little more holistic than that, right? Like that's not as oh extreme ownership is definitely more holistic than that for sure. It's a uh, it's an it's pretty cool if you're into war stories and stuff. It's a compilation of uh, them working him him describing some of the the him as a Navy SEAL in the Battle of Ramadi. And then uh, tying it back into the idea of crisis management with limited resources without uh, while maintaining composure and and doing that through the the practice of extreme ownership, which is what do I need to do to get it done and and, and taking accountability and responsibility for everything around you. Yeah, sweet. Okay, I'm going to love that book. Um, Yeah, it's a great book. It's an unbelievable book. What I really like about David Goggins is he talks about that same stuff. Like it is the meat and the bones of like how you got from one to the next. People don't, you know, people... Did Those, you read his book too? Can't hurt me. I'm starting it. I'm like halfway, it, maybe it's, halfway through. It's so powerful. I literally was crying. Yeah, dude. I, I literally broke down into tears. And the the opening chapters where he's talking about his childhood, it reduced me to tears, mostly because I was like reliving my own childhood in different instances. <laughs> but uh, dude, his story, his narrative, his his strength, it's just his balls to go on record of all that the stuff. The man too. is the man. The man has transcended humanity, bro. He's, so, he's, he's, so people haven't person. stopped this to go Google him or don't know anything about him. Uh, the guy went from, you know, 300 or 350 pounds overweight, working a dead end job, as he described it, his words and those sort of things. To Literally like, a cockroach exterminator. Yes. <laughs> to, uh, to signing up for a 100 mile, 24 hour race and completing it in 19 hours without ever running a marathon in his life to the point that he was carried by his wife bleeding from his, his ass and just like sitting in a a tub, like falling apart as a human being, but loving the fact that he figured out how to run a hundred miles and push his body to that far of an extreme. Um, so he's known for pushing his body to absolute extremes. He realized along the way, just how you can destroy and hurt yourself and like how you got to go about like good, good regimens and stuff like that. But the thing with him, the thing with him is he wanted to show that you could push your body far beyond what you ever thought was, was potential. Yeah. He's got this thing called the 40% rule, which again, I honestly (laughs) don't know if I could do that shit, but like, he's like, whenever you think you're about to collapse, you're only at 40%. It's like, Whoa. And this he's a, he has the world. He's had the world pull up record. He's a champion ultra marathoner. He's the only person to do Navy SEAL, Army Ranger, and one other special operations classification in history in the military history. Yeah. He's a I mean, the guy's a superhuman and he he got into the Navy SEALs and into the Navy from being three hundred and fifty pounds, three hundred pounds overweight and a cockroach exterminator and just said, Fuck this. Yeah. <laughs> just changed his stars, man. So to bring it back yeah. into behavior analysis, like I liked that he um I like that he and Jocko and those people acknowledge those transition states. Like you have to of get course. from one place to the next. And that's what our field's about, man. We're about individual success, how to measure those sort of things. Exactly. I honestly think that a lot of these big movements, a lot of these big motivational speakers, I'm using that air quotes also because I know some of those guys don't like to be labeled that. Um, Whatever. What they want to do is they want to figure out how to understand this even better. So like marrying those folks with our field, I think would be amazing, man. Um <clears throat> It might be or have there. people from our field do that. Like I think Pat Fryman is the closest thing as far as like when he speaks to tapping into that kind of like visceral response, call and response with the crowd because he understands those things. Yeah. And the, the hardcore empiricists just don't have the social skills, don't have the speaking, the understanding of crowd control and crowd engagement to be able to do yeah. the narrative stuff that you're talking about and, I, and yeah, like weaving and I, things into a story. I just want to tell folks like I don't want to discredit in my own personal adventures of this sort of stuff, like the importance of those sort of people, we all got to work. Of together, course. No, no, right? no. Yeah. yeah. The Definitely point is, not doing that. We all That's have to, I mean by that. we all have to work together. I know. Um, yeah. I mean, it's a 2 billion. I mean, the self-help industry is a $2 billion industry and we're all competing for the same clients. Yeah. <laughs> when there's, we could be competing for, we our, our client list should be infinitely possible because as long as there's human beings, we should have possible clients. Exactly. And if anyone should be working on self-help or self-improvement, it should be people who exercise the yeah. science of behavior change. So, not some guru who came up with five steps to success. So I've got it's a... It's absolutely ludicrous. I've got a story for you that's kind of relevant. Um, in 2000 and... 
11, 12, Mark Mowdy and I found this group called um, Quantified Self. And the idea was that you were trying to just create a place, a community where people were just trying to figure out what sensors could measure the behavior that I'm interested in, whether that's biological behavior, whatever. Really cool group, quantifiedself.com. And we watched them. We would read. There was a lot of bio sort of stuff. So there was a lot of people really digging the bio level and like, well, how did that influence? But people were literally using like this kind of like jank approach to single subject methodology to understand what was going on in their life. And it was like crazy stuff. Like people would literally be like, Hey, I've, I've, I realized how to, to prove that I actually do have cancer to my, <laughs> to my MD and it saved my life. Like it was shit like that, where they showed with sensors and like their ability to go in and just like science, how to prove to people some really cool, crazy shit. Um, and it was a community that was critiquing, but very warming at the same time, right? Like they welcome and bring people in, but they really critique and like make sure they're doing some cool stuff. Ran their own conferences and shit. I ended up going to start one of their chapters in Reno. Um, didn't get it sustainably going uh, for longer than about six or nine months. It was hard to find a critical mass. I now, I now know how to find people a lot easier and like make those sort of things work, I think, a little bit better. But I ended up submitting to present at their conference in this like round table discussion about the role of behavior analysis and self-management in single case design. Again, really rudimentary on my skill set of communicating people outside of our field. And like, it's getting better because of me flopping in situations like that. But what was most fascinating to me is there was an online group I was a part of. Um, I still am. I kind of talked to them back and forth in like a Slack group. Mm-hmm. And I was talking about behavior analysis being my like worldview. And the leader of that was so against behavior analysis, man that I got the hammer thrown down on me, like in their he form. He banned you? Huh? He banned you? No, I, he did not ban me, but he basically said like, uh, we don't believe in that stuff here, essentially. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Um, what? He, did he give you any more information? He had a he had a really rudimentary, like most people have a view yeah. of behavior analysis and he didn't understand the comprehensive contextual part of it. So it was me not really being tactful and not noticing those sort of things early on and, and altering my approach that caused the problem, but kind of full circle, man. Um, so there was, I don't remember the exact interaction, but they invited someone to come out. I can't remember who it was. If it was Nuringer, if it was um, Heinlein, it might've been Heinlein. They invited somebody to come out to their conference and speak. So when I saw that, I kind of like chimed back in with a much softer message. Like, Hey, I know that guy. <laughs> like, um, and I was like, it's that behavior analysis stuff. And the guy replied saying, yeah, he's going to go out to Chicago and go to ABI this year because Highline kind of like changes his view. Um, oh, wow. That's good. And, uh, why did we even bring up quantified self? Do you remember? Dude, I don't know. This is fun. This okay. Is awesome. the... This is the whole point of podcasting, well, bro. You just fucking go down the rabbit hole <laughs> and you just ride that wave till it's over. Just um, go. Don't think, talk. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to try to bring Stream it back Stream of around, consciousness, my man. Right. Um, but I don't know. I guess... I guess, I mean, I lost my main point, but, um, dude, you never know when things are going to circle back around. I really hope to have like buy that guy a beer and be like, Hey man, I'm sorry. I was that, that asshole of a behavior analyst back then. Um, and I'd love to, to be a part of more of their, their organization, what they're doing again. I told so many behavior analysts, like go to this event. Oh, that's what it was, dude. So when I went to the first, uh, event, their opening keynote was talking about how they needed to have a framework to understand how to how to approach researching at, with an N of one. I was like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> we are got that, buddy. <laughs> and this was, and this was before I was like banned from, or not banned, but this is before I got the hammer thrown down on me. Um, and like, I was just like, you guys need to read Sidman's tactics to scientific research. Like we have what you guys are looking for. And the whole point oh, of like, I don't know, I don't want to live by goals that I can't necessarily control. Um, but I don't mind behaving in the direction of them. And one of those is like, dude, if I could figure out how to get some of the right people at the right table, these guys are all Silicon Valley dudes. They're doing really cool shit, man. Like they, they, they are moving human behavior in ways that our field wish we could, but they don't have the measurement system and our field. Yeah. They have the money though. Yeah. But they, they, they're the missing component maybe in a way. Um, like yeah. the marriage of those two different fields would be really good. I'm glad that I figured out that connection. That shit drives me nuts, dude. Oh, wow, that's unbelievable. Um, so yeah, man, quantified self, dude. Um, if anyone wants, yeah, I, I can't remember. I checked that out actually. I think maybe it was on your recommendation, or maybe it was on Marks. I've linked it. On Marks, actually. I've linked it a few times. I wrote, I put up uh, a self management project on consuming behavior analytic 
articles um, that's sure. still linked on their site. Um, <clears throat> what is your self? What is your self management routine? Do you have a routine, or are you just kind of um, like fucking go all the, all the time? So, it was really solid for a while, but I've had to change it. So, first thing is, is it's always evolving. It's dynamic. It's never a static thing. Like if anybody's yeah. listening and expects you to have a a static thing. Maybe some people that fits, but for me, it just doesn't work. What I've had to move into was something that is like, you have different types of days in which you do different types of things. Um, And so it's kind of this algorithm of what type of day is this? Is this a content creation day? Is this a catch up on email day? Is this, I was just gone for two weeks sort of week, you know, like there's different things like that that I'm figuring out. Um, Dude, it used to be though, alarm was set for... Uh, 4.30, I was out of the house at the gym, 4.45 to 5 at the latest. Um, I was into work at like 7.30 uh, or 8. I crushed out my work day and then I'd work on stuff until about um, 11 o'clock. And then it was 11 to 11.45 p.m. was my time to kind of like consume whatever. And then I'd pass out. It was five hours. I was back up. I was tired every day when I went to bed. I was tired when I woke up. But for me, caffeine, the right balance and all that was able to keep me going on that. Um, But that was uh, that was rattled when I uh, met my now girlfriend and like that sort of changed things in a really good way. Um, So like that isn't sustainable for a lifetime necessarily. Just wait wait till you get fat for a little bit. (laughs) So happy, happy equals chub. (laughs) Um, Well, dude, for me. For me, the, uh, for me, like that's so for self management, man, like you got to look in different domains of your life. Like, what are the different domains? So, family versus professional versus, um, your personal relationships, your, your colleagues, your friendships, or whatever it is that you have. Like, for me, I looked at how am I behaving towards these sort of things? How did I do the last week? Um, and what was that like? If I realized, whoa, like I used to do this thing and I still do it in the shower. Where I'd think about like real quick in those domains, like how have I performed in the last week? When I think of something, um, so for example, like this morning I was thinking about like, when is the last time that I had like seen my sister and like been over and like seen her? Like when you can't tact or identify when that last was, like you probably have a problem there when it comes to your self-management based on your values and like where you rank that sort of stuff. So, so for me, man, it was like twofold. It was like identify when things are going well and when you need to collect more data. As you collect more data in your life, you start to have a better framework for how are those those level trends and variability in your data sets going, I think. Um, but then the whole other side of it is conceptualizing what's going on and like how to how to attack it, which that's hard, dude. Um, I don't know. Do you like do you, what's yours first before we talk and before we get oh, into man. how to analyze problems in your self-management? What's mine your is, routine? Mine is pretty. I'm, I'm, I've I've. It's pretty rigid, actually. I mean, I have, I my workout routine is P90X because it's automatic, it's easy, and I don't have to go anywhere. I used to play disc golf all the time, but I just don't. That's not enough exercise, and I can't. And I've found that for me to avoid any type of anxiety or depression, I need to exercise at least sixty minutes a day. That is an absolute a non-negotiable. So for me, it's more like I have my non-negotiables and I have my negotiables. And then my non-negotiables are 60 minutes a day of exercise and then at least an hour of just me time, period. Um, so it's two hours a day that I, I will not sacrifice no matter what. Everything cool. else is scheduled to the point of how much time I'll spend with my wife. And she, if she hears this, she'll not know that, but she knows it now. But I mean, like, <laughs> <laughs> like, um, and I I really try to do that. And and honestly, I really do kind of, I'm, I'm a little bit more... I like the, I I force myself to get obsessed, man. I have this very, I have an addictive personality, a predilection. I can't believe I just said that. I'm a behavior analyst that I have addictive personality, but I mean like for real, I have a, I have a tendency to get incredibly obsessed with things and just pursue them in a way that is probably not healthy right now. It just so happens to be my doctoral work and this podcast and my actual work. So it fits all, all is gelling together. But um, I had to overcome a lot of things in, in self-management to, to get to this point. I mean, I definitely had a video game addiction at one point that was out of control that I had to interrupt and troubleshoot. So if you want to talk about troubleshooting, I feel like breaking routines and getting out of ruts. I mean, I've had a lot of bouts of depression through the years or a lot of different um, instances where I was just not necessarily self-destructive, but not engaging in 
reasonably productive behavior that fed my soul in a way that mattered, you know? And, uh, dude, yeah, I have, a, I mean, I, I put I, I, any of those video game TV shows or documentaries you would watch of people that are addicted to games. I mean, I, I, I got 11,000 hours in a single game. That's like 480 full 24 hour periods. That's a part of my life. I'll never get back. It's gone, <laughs> you know? And like the thing about those types of games is they're, they're socially mediated. They're community oriented. They're incredible. I mean, they're casino level addicting. That's like, about, that's about four and a half years of, <laughs> your job time for anybody like trying to think <laughs> dude that. it's I, I i'm not like it it was fucking nuts like what, what and i became game? elder scrolls online that's uh nice yes it was uh, really rough. into first person shooters particularly <laughs> yeah. modern warfare 2 yeah. when that came out yeah. oh my gosh dude i would wake up um i would wake up 16,000th in the world and i would go to bed when i was in the top 10 yeah, and that's my that's what I got addicted to the competitive piece of it. Yeah, because I'm such a competitive person. Same, so like, dude. I would have, I'd be like leader weekly leaderboards, baby. Got to get in the top 100 North American server, dude. Let's go. I work and it's just so like sickness, hard. man. Yeah, I work so and it's like, hard. what am I doing? If I read and and worked harder on like stuff that mattered, I would like that amount of time. Like they say, it takes ten thousand hours to master skill. I could have been a master violinist in the <laughs> amount of time I dedicated to that fucking game, or like just something. I could have like gotten a doctorate. Shit, like you know. Yeah. And then I was like, why? Wait, wait a second. You should go do that instead of this bullshit. Yeah. So I I actually did what I do with my kids or in my work. I did an environmental assessment. Yeah. I was like, this shit's got to go. I constructed a whole different setup and I made it, I increased the response effort so unbelievably to get that shit to, to play my game yeah. to the point where I even went in and sabotaged it to where it's almost unplayable because I don't have all the shit that I need to do what I need to do inside of the game. Yeah. Um, that it's now almost repulsive to me. Yeah. And uh, I've turned it into that, a totally different thing. There's that Skinner quote that's something to the effect of like the self is only valuable when it's becomes valuable to everybody else or something like that exactly um and so for self-management i've always thought of uh it it has a component of the social people around you and who's around you to help you out as well and uh i think there's two levels of that there's the people immediately around you but there's also uh uh i'm about to do this that book i mentioned that i'm reading like great artists steal um by whoever um i'll link in the show notes too they said like they do whatever you need to like frame the people that you want to be emulating and put them in front of your desk so that you're exactly. looking at them. Right. Like there's so many ways to go about it, but the community, the people around you are also the ones that you need to be um, focusing on there. So for me, like I have always had people in my life that I trust immensely with giving me feedback on like, yo dude, you need to chill out for me with video games. It was uh, my, my roommate at the time, <coughs> My roommate at the time, he was like, hey, school starts tomorrow. And I was like, yeah, right, dude. Like, We got a few more weeks and winter break. And he's like, no, like school's tomorrow. Are you ready? And I was like, are you shitting me? Like I missed I, – I just – Yeah, you time game. traveled. Dude, for five yeah. weeks, all I did Yeah, is, you got an emotional DeLorean and you were fucking gone. Yeah. Dude, that's all yeah. I did is I woke up and I was like yeah. – I would, I would – I would play until about four in the morning. I'd sleep two hours. I'd go to work. I'd come back and I would play for 12 or 14 hours and I would work as yeah. hard as I could to get up to there before I passed oh. out. And, oh, yeah. uh, I can't believe my wife is still here. Like, what I, <laughs> like it's some, I'm, I'm so lucky. It's unbelievable. Like what I had to do is <laughs> I handed over my console to my roommate and I said, put this in your room and like, I'm not allowed to have it for the rest of the semester. Yeah. Um, I opened that thing once, one summer in between uh, my first and second year of grad school. And I kind of slipped into it for a weekend and I came back out of that and I was like, that's it. And I took nope. that thing and I dropped it in the trash, dude. Dude, digital crack. It's digital crack. That's literally dude. what I call it. That fucking game in particular is digital crack. And back, the one thing to say about your environmental piece, that's why my basement, like if people see my ridiculous stuff i mean all the artwork my wife made all the uh, automated all the artwork for me because she knows i love comic books but the reason i like it so much or i'm surrounded by it is because i really love the 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 Jungian idea of archetypes and how the narratives feed what you need 
to operate throughout your day. I mean, being surrounded by my favorite superhero symbols and being surrounded by these these things that symbolize like emerging emerging as a new powerful entity of your own volition. You know what I mean? Just yeah. from the sheer force of will and willingness to to engage the process, you know, inspires me and it, it helps keep me in this really good positive framework that keeps me focused, helps me continue to execute. And they're, they're, they're ongoing and continuous SDs to keep my head down and grind and not yeah. feel, uh, you know, not, and trust the process, you know, like, I, and like, that's like the, like we were talking about comic books before, uh, with Rick, you know, like, that's why I love like the green lantern and stuff. And I follow those stories because his superpower is the power of will, you know, yeah. I love that stuff. And I, I feed that narrative, man. Yeah. Like it's, it's, uh, it's just like you have to enrich your environment in that way. And if it's cheesy, fuck it. Like I even have like on my ceiling here, I have like plastered all these different, this probably somebody would come in here and they'd be like beautiful mind schizophrenic crazy. But um, <laughs> like, I, it's like, I have, I have all these pages ripped out with different like titles of, of, of papers or books, ideas, or just like concepts that I love to explore one day. And I just like plastering my ideas everywhere around me because your words feed you, your, your space feeds you, man. It, it, For sure. it changes the way you operate. Yeah, dude. So, so like I, I, you would, sh- I'm inspired now to like go and create a video on this. I think I'm going to maybe even today. <clears throat> I've kept every denial letter like that was of significance to me. Oh, I love that shit. And I, I love pr- that. I printed them out, dude, from uh, the Nevada ABA Association saying like, no, you're not going to be able to film in here. Um, we want to like figure out a way to do this more systemically and that never working. That's okay to be told no. That's cool. But like Absolutely. that was something that I kept. ABI, um, I've got some stuff from them on the Saba Awards. They were saying like, um, sorry, like your efforts are cool, but we don't think that you're um, – doing the best work when it comes to dissemination or whatever. And like, that's cool. Whatever. Cool. I'm printing that. I'm putting my fucking wall too. Um, I've got those sort of things hung up, but I also have other shit that keeps me going. Like back here, I've got uh, a picture signed by one of my favorite YouTube creators. I've got his hot, I've got a different one's uh coffee line. I've got uh what else dude? Um, I want to go to New Zealand. My dad went and he, I was so jealous. I couldn't go. And he brought me back a, a box of uh, whiskey. And I told myself, I'm not going to open that until I create the perfect conditions and rules under which I'm allowed to open it. Which exactly. One of, the, one of those is I'm not going to come back and open that that thing of uh, whiskey until I've gone to New Zealand and I come back. Like That's cool. Like, but that's it, dude. Like, that's, I think that's absurd for some people. But like, um, like my, I've got goals to getting on top of giant peaks in the middle of the U.S. and all over the fucking place. And I keep, uh, I bought a six pack of beers. I wrote the peaks that I wanted to get on top of. And I put all those things on my mantle above my headdresser. And I've knocked three of the six of those out. That is going to be the cool. nastiest beer when I get on top of that final one. But I will enjoy that son of a bitch, man. It's going <laughs> to taste so good. Right? I um, love that shit, man. That's awesome. And it's it's sitting up in my house. Like this beer that says, you know, Mount Shasta cr- next to a crushed can yeah. with like the backpacking tag of the other ones I've been on. It's um, awesome. But it's like, it's it's setting up your environment, man, is is a big part of it. But tying it in, like you're saying, like your narrative and like what it is that you want to be. Um, for me then, dude, it's just a matter of logistics. Like how do you do what when? Um, nothing's going to go yeah. as planned necessarily. Exactly. But you'll get better and better and better at getting there. And you just keep setting those goals, keep setting those plans, man. Um, Do you have any mantras you like to repeat to yourself or any quotes that you like anchor yourself to if you're spiraling? Because I I definitely have these moments where like, especially like self-doubt, imposter syndrome, just all that stuff creeps in because it's like. You just, I mean, especially you get criticism online or, or even just at work or life in general. And like, you yeah. just have those moments of weakness where you're just trying to gather yourself. And it's like, how, what, do you have any language that you use to snap yourself back out of it? Uh, I mean, I've got a few things like nothing's going to be given to you. You got to do work, right? Like anybody who says anything like that. My favorite one is uh, right now and probably maybe forever is uh, Casey Neistat, the YouTuber. He's got a tattoo that says do work. And I was like, that is the stupidest thing, but I will have that thing tattooed on my arm too for that daily reminder of like, unless you put in the work, nothing's going to be, be given to you. Like, um, you have to put in that sort of work. Now, I always like that one from Einstein, like great it's back here on my wall. It's covered up there with the door right now. Something like, uh, me, hold on. It's great spirits. I've always encountered, uh, 
violent opposition from mediocre minds. And like, I don't think that I am that, but I think our field and the people that I am with, like, I believe in that sort of thing. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I'm not a great mind on my own, but us as a community are a great mind and we, we have to figure out how to move you know, forward. And, and you know, I, I think that it's important, it's important to say that when we're talking to podcasts, because you can get lost in this kind of stuff and get accused of being a narcissist. So you have to kind of preface it where I don't think I'm a great mind, but I think that in your own inner dialogue, when you close your eyes at night, before you fall asleep, you have to have the audacity of belief in that you are something or that you deserve things or that you have that, you have the well, the aspiration towards that at least and not not be ashamed to feel that way if that's something that you aspire towards or you feel like you have well, so I, I, but so anyway i just to, just to preface that not because I, yeah. I don't know i don't think i think part of it is like fuck it man like who cares if if somebody thinks that you're not worthy it doesn't matter like do you think you're worthy you know <laughs> yeah, like so, i mean it's yeah. for real like it's other people's opinions well, are so fucking irrelevant it's yeah and to, to the the last thing I was going to bring that into is I do hold up certain opinions of certain people more than I do others. Sure. And so uh, as an example, like the the Fryman video that I put out, some people are like, oh, it's really self-promo. And I was like, fuck that, dude. Yeah, like, that was that was absurd. But the the thing is, is um, 99% of the people that I value like didn't find it that sort of way. So it's like, cool, I'm not off. Like you got to benchmark yourself with people that share the same values as you. Um, and, and like, if someone wants to critique that, cool. You're also going to be critiquing everybody else in that case. And you're going to be critiquing the folks like Fryman, which I don't think would really happen in person. And, and, and they do those sort of things, but it's, uh, yeah, like I, I, I do what you're saying where it's like I at the end of the day, like going to bed, it's like, hey, um, I'm on track with the things I want to do and the people I care about say that I'm on track, you know, um, or they're, they're at least rooting for you still. And that's exactly that's what matters there. For um, sure, dude. Yeah. My, my I have this. Uh, there's this uh, again. Uh, I'm exposing how much of a flipping sci-fi nerd i am but whatever <laughs> like uh there's this quote from frank herbert's dune um and it's uh it's called the litany of fear and i i recited it in myself i recite it quietly covertly in my mind when i'm uh if i'm feeling that moment of anxiety or yeah. uh, or whatever it's like i must not fear fear is the mind killer fear is the little death that leads to total obliteration like yeah, you know it's uh, and I just continue. I like use that shit as like a mantra over I, and over again. I have a uh, private <clears throat> list of YouTube videos that I've saved that light that fire for me or like help me yeah. out. And uh, I keep that thing, dude. It's something that it doesn't work every time, but I've gotten pretty good at like um, not being the right mindset or like being able to like do what you want to do. Like the right stuff, I can queue up and kind of get me get me going. Um, one sure. of them's Gary V's five minute plea to do. Type in that. <laughs> oh, nice. YouTube, yeah, I know what that is. YouTube, it's Gary V's five minute plea to do everybody out there. It's uh, it's rad, man. He's talking about how you you have to start moving forward. And if I could art- articulate it in like behavior analytic terms a little bit more, until you start putting stuff out there, you're not gonna have the data streams that you need to to be able to respond to. So it's this idea of you can create it. But you have to create it and put it out there. You have to get it out there to be able to get those data streams and that feedback. And that's what I've been living by on the <clears> Daily <throat> BA, dude, and this other stuff. Like until you put it out there, you know what's going to happen. Like you literally do not have access to the data streams that you need to until you start doing that sort of stuff. Um, oh, yeah. Get the fuck out of your head, man. That's – I don't know. It's like for me, there's a couple things. Number one, get out of your head because I'm a person who's lived in my head for a lot of years. And uh, number two is as long as you're speaking your your truth, as long as what you're saying you actually believe and you're being authentic and earnest about it, it like even if, even if it is offensive or even if someone doesn't like it or whatever, at least it's defensible because you're not just being – you're not exuding – some faux persona or you're not exuding some ideology you don't stand by or it's not you're not speaking to something that you don't actually feel and to me that matters so much and it 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 really removes a lot of those uh downer feelings sometimes if i'm feeling that stuff because it's like okay dude did you tell the truth like is that really what you think is that really what you feel yeah okay well maybe you're wrong but at least you did not you know, hide behind some, some lie or some dishonest way of going about what you think about a thing. And, and yeah. at least now it's out in the open, you know? For sure. Um, 
that goes back to that radical honesty thing we're talking about. That's the beautiful thing about radical honesty is that like, if you, if you live that way, like the only way people find leverage over you and where, where I believe anxiety or fear come from is that, um, as far as like environment, like actual emotional responses is if you, if you have something that someone can leverage over you, you know, like if, if no one can ever have leverage over you because everything you do is completely transparent and open and honest, then there, you literally should have nothing to fear other than accidental death. Like there, that's it. Like, yeah. cause then no one can actually have power over you. There's this great book, um, by, uh, there's a man named Victor Frankel, uh, called man's search for meaning. And he was a Holocaust survivor and he wrote this book. Um, he, I think he was a psychiatrist. Um, and he wrote this book basically from a first person perspective with no names, recounting the experience of a man in the concentration camps in Auschwitz and stuff. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea behind the book was that there is no name for the character. The idea was that he wrote it so that if someone, as someone is reading it, they become the character and they experience all the different feelings that you feel. And that what he's really though recounting is his own experience. And the whole idea behind it, even in the concept or the place of a Nazi concentration camp, you know, where he saw where people started dying or the, when people were more likely to die was, and they would lose hope and they would give up on themselves and they would give up their, their freedom to choose not to be enslaved in that moment by what was happening around them. And he describes it later in life, how that was the, the that was like his true freedom was actually in the moment when he was closest to that death because he he knew that no matter how what they took from him they could never take away his mind and his ability to just exist in that way and his will and um dude man search for meaning is a serious book he was he originally published it with no no name no title no nothing because he didn't want anyone to even ascribe it to his experience but then some colleagues pressured him to do so and that's why it's it's his it's his names on it now but it's a absolutely impactful amazing book but it speaks to narrative it speaks to the idea that you know it's uh it, if you're telling yourself the right story if you're engaging in the right verbal behavior man you can yeah. get the right motivation going you know you can get the right outputs you're looking at yeah and to tie it back into like that highline article that we can link to for folks is i was critiquing it a little bit because he's saying that there's a lot of different things that you could look at when it comes to how do you understand its role but my thing is like the better you are at understanding behavior analysis or concepts or principles and how things work, the better you're going to be able. And then pairing that with like your own life and understanding your own situation through those terms, like that's exactly. it. That's self-management, dude. That's it. That's the exactly. essence of self-management is literally just using our concepts and our terms to be able to understand your behavior and how that data is going. If you can pinpoint and focus in on something to measure and then you can apply that sort of stuff you're going to be able to move things forward to be able to understand what's going on around you. Sure. It's hard. Sure. It's not easy. Nothing in life is the more you apply it, the more fluent you get. Right. Um, Do you find the more you learn about just behavior science in general, the, the more, I don't want to use the word confusing, but almost like the more supernatural it feels over time. Like <laughs> I, it, at least for me, it's like, the more, and again, I am not at all a metaphysical person <laughs> just yeah, to be yeah, clear, yeah, yeah. to yeah. put that out there. <laughs> but I mean, like there, I do appreciate poetry though. You know what I mean? And there's just uh, the more I learn about the, it, there's just an elegant simplicity to it. That just seems it to me, it like it sings a song about living when you can like the more you learn about the way environmental relations affect people and how, you know, there are all these different things out there that you contact that shape your history and do dictate and, and affect the way you're going to operate in your life and that kind of thing. And it almost seems like there is a certain serendipity about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I, I think that's why you talk about like, uh, there's some really famous physicists and other scientists that are like religious at the end of the day, or they, they believe in this higher entity or deity because, sure. because I think what happens is you start to get a more comprehensive pre picture to things happen you realize like oh this might be to this divine creation or like some sorry this is like uh this there there might be this uh uh you know unifying theory and like entity that kind of created this perfectly laid out world um or you my understanding is just like you realize there's so many different variables that you now understand and how they work that it just kind of yeah i mean just to be clear i think i think it's a combination it's clarity is really what i'm talking about i think that if you get to understand the mechanisms and the, the different things that affect us around us, it, there is a degree of clarity. And with clarity comes this just, I don't know, it's like that cold calm that's crazy. I mean, it's literally, 
I keep going back to it, but it's waking up from the goddamn matrix, man. It's like, it's that moment. It's like, that. it's like, it's a, it's Buddha sitting under the Bodhi tree, man. It's a fucking Jedi mind trick. It's unbelievable. Like there is something absolutely amazing about understanding. Yeah. It, you can, contr- by controlling your environment, you control yourself and you can, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's, 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 it's fucking Jedi shit, man. Like yeah. there's no other yeah. way to put it, man. Like yeah. it's, it's real life Jedi shit. And, like, and that's where it's and the, fucking superpower. And that's where my, like my example of my colleague is like, if we're trying to understand why someone else isn't doing something, it's like, I don't know if that person necessarily understood the essence of behavior analysis. Like if you, exactly. you know what I mean? Like if you're not yeah. deploying this stuff in every point and area of your life, like you didn't really get bit by the bug. Like you didn't have the right like, adequate supervisor or training yeah. or experience to really understand just like how radical this is in the sense of like, it is something you deploy throughout your entire life. Um, And I don't know, man, like the world just makes sense. It's kind of scary sometimes that it does, or if it doesn't, it's because there's so much complexity into the problem that it's going to take me a lot of time to really try to understand it and and whatnot. Yeah. And I think that's where like to look at the, if you take that idea that you just described that clarity and that that's where the arrogance of it comes into play sometimes. I think where it's like, we go almost dark side, you know, Darth Vader level shit where it's like, you know, the, there's this arrogance and the superiority that comes with the clarity that you get. Or on the flip side, if you did it, if we did approach it as a field with some more humility and we did make it accessible in a sense and not accessible by simplifying it, because I think that cheapens it. You yep. make it accessible by making it something that people can feel and emote towards, you know, those are uh-huh. different things. And I think that's a mistake that isn't generally mis that, that's just an idea that's misunderstood when people talk about it. Um, it, it, you can, you can, really make it attractive and substantive and something that you really want to touch and play with and you want to interact with. Um, For sure. Yeah, I totally I've, got agree a, with you. I've got a call in five minutes. I should have warned you beforehand, but this is a perfect time to bring it back around, dude. Um, that was the whole point of Houston. We have a narrative and where we started with this is like, is like, uh, you just, you said it, you said it well, man, I don't want to restate your points. The Randy Olson's like, Hey, we we haven't really tried this in science and we've seen it deployed elsewhere. Like what, exactly. if, what if we tried this? And if anybody's listening to this and like freaking out because behavior analysts are talking about personality and all this other shit that we've been talking about today. Um, I want to challenge people to look up Let Me Hear Your Voice, the book that put early <laughs> intervention and behavioral intervention on the map for autism by Catherine Maurice. Go check that out. Talk to any analyst that's out there uh, that's been around from the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s. And you'll see the role that that book played. Not that it was the only one, but it was a very important mechanism to why we're even around here today. And it is a pure narrative around a mother who had two children diagnosed with autism, sharing a story about how it versus hugging therapy, behavior analysis versus hugging therapy or holding therapy, sorry, um, was what she was trying to understand and and grapple with. Um, And spoiler alert, it's behavior analysis and the behavioral approach that that she talks about in that book that set our, our, our way, um, in our field. So, um, I like this dude. This was good. Like narratives, narratives. Cool, man. There's some important shit here. Oh, one of my favorite topics. Well, uh, that's why when I saw that you were doing a thing on uh, narrative, I was like, man, I have been down this road deep. My first, <laughs> when I wanted to do the podcast forever, the first attempt at the podcast was about using narrative. I mean, my, th- my Instagram handles explanatory fiction for that reason. I, I like the idea of using narrative to shape behavior. So yeah, dude, the plan is to keep iterating and move off of this. I want to turn it into a, uh, from a three hour to an eight hour thing. Um, just so people know, I'm going to go check out Randy Olson down in uh, Boulder city. That's going to be weird and cool. I'm welcoming anybody and anybody to explore it with me on the sense of, dude, if you wanted to like jump in and and do a workshop with me on it. Like, obviously, we got to hit our certain objectives, but I'm going to iterate on this thing hard. I've got another, like, eight, I think, lined up that haven't been announced yet. And I'm just going to iterate and go, dude. There's something right here. here, brother. You need to check out. This is a must need for you if you're going to be talking about narrative. And, okay. And it's not behavior analytic. Read it to folks. Okay. It's, it's Joseph Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces, and it's The Hero's Journey. Um, and it's just, it, again, like, it's not behavior analytic, okay, to be clear. But... It provides a reasonable threshold of stimuli, whatever frames that you could use to, to disseminate behavior analytic principles in such a way that would make them digestible, in my opinion. All right, please, wherever you found this, make sure that you go in, comment, tell us how you liked it. Make sure you answer the questions that we left there. 
and tell a friend. Please tag, share. It is the way that we can start to break through the barriers and share what behavior analysis has to offer and have these more meaningful conversations in a public sphere. Remember also you can go to anchor.fm backslash the controversial exchange and call in and leave your thoughts there as well. Again, privately where we will be choosing some of our favorites to air on the anchor app. Our next episode is on self management and narrative, finding your story, communicating your story, what role it has in behavior analysis, dissemination. I think you're going to like it. It's just Dimitri and I riffing. Now, I have a quick fun fact for you that is, did you know that one in 1,300 people, that's right, in 2018, one in 1,300 people that actually tuned into the content chose to support or help out? So I mentioned Patreon before this. Patreon.com backslash the Daily VA is a values-based system that I set up to where if you're enjoying this, you can go in, you can support for as little as dollar a month, and you get some sort of exchange as well. So some people receive this in a video series where you could watch online, see us talking back and forth. Other cool things include tiers like the Daily BA, the closed like Facebook group where I share other ideas, resources, things like that. Occasionally I get courses, giveaways to hand out to people. We get discount codes that I share with you. I make that super easy to where you can snag some cheaper rates to big events in behavior analysis. And I'm paired up with an amazing artist named Lester who makes these um, just great, phenomenal, really dope posters of legends in our field that we put out there as well. And you can snag some of those depending on your tier. And occasionally I bring on sponsors through this. I make sure that I communicate that with you and note sponsors. It's only if we truly, truly align on our value system. So that's our show. There are currently over 94 people in the Daily BA Patreon like closed group that's accessing these sort of things. I'd love for you to join. So really consider going and checking it out. As a gift for signing up, you get access to all the streams from last year of what we actually produce behind the scenes. You can catch Dimitri and I on Twitter at the Controversial X, that's Controversial EX, or on Instagram at the Controversial Exchange. We will be manning these. We will be answering questions and replying and sharing. So that's how you can reach us in between episodes in addition to Anchor. And to thank you so much to our listeners, you are the reason that we get to do this. The people on Patreon help us support and make it financially possible but everybody following, liking, and sharing, you all are helping in this grand vision. So thank you. And I have uh, one last thing that I need to read to you just so we're all kosher and we're on the same page. And that is the views expressed during the Controversial Exchange podcast series are solely those of the individuals involved and do not reflect the official policy or position of any other agency, organization, employer, or company. Assumptions made in the analysis are not reflective of the position of any other entity other than the authors, and since we are critically thinking human beings, these views are always subject to change, revision, and rethinking at any time. Please do not hold us to them in perpetuity. This podcast series is to educate and inform, provide discussion, and does not constitute professional advice. That's your controversial exchange.